Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the OSIN Curious Webcast. I am Micah Hoffman, and I am thrilled to have you here with us. I'm thrilled to have some attendees and a wonderful guest that we're going to be interviewing in just a moment. But before we get into that, let's see who's with us today. Our panelists today, I'm going to introduce Nix Intel. Nix, actually, I'd like you to introduce Nix Intel. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's Nick Sintel. I'm really glad you could join us, whether you're watching us on the webcast or listening on the podcast. And I'm going to introduce next, uh, spin the wheel around, I'm going to ask Ginsberg to say hello. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you. Pretty appreciate it, Nick. Um, Ginsberg 5150. Um, yeah, glad everyone could make it. Uh, thanks for the guests to, to come in here, Paul. I appreciate it. And uh, let's talk to Ray. Hey underscore Ray here and I'm glad to be here today and I'm glad to uh, have a good guest and a lot of good audience members. Um, over to Dutch. Hi everybody, uh, Nico Rekens aka Dutch Ozen Guy here and well with no further ado I would like to introduce our guest of today. Um, his name is Peter, Peter King. Um, if I was informed correct, you pioneered a systematic research and analysis on online jihadists for the British government uh, way back in 2004. And you also led a team of experts at the BBC um, in the same field. And I even figured out that you're an um, Arabic speaking independent consultant, right? That's so, right. Um, and you're now the director and co-founder of Ebex Mind. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing Ibex mind right, but it's Ibex. an organization. Ibex. Uh, yeah. Ibex. Okay, it's my Dutch accent. Yeah. So Ibex Mind, um, um, it's an organization that helps um, build resilience and mitigate the effects of exposure from harmful online content, which, well, we are going to talk about for sure today. So thanks a lot uh, for joining us today. Um, okay. Can you... Please tell me a little bit more about your OSIN career. Can you tell us how you ended up, for instance, investigating jihadist groups? Yeah, sure, yeah. So I started out actually as a journalist way back in, you know, the early 2000s, actually late 90s. I uh, worked out in the Middle East. That was after studying Arabic, so that was my uh, major, and uh, got into journalism, working for AFP. Um, out in Jordan and then Egypt for a couple of years, then came back to the UK. Uh, and worked for part of the BBC called BBC Monitoring, which um, looks at the world's media. Um, when I started, it was more traditional media, but then social media started becoming much more of a thing. Um, so back in uh, 2004, then I started working um, specifically with like jihadist content. And jihadist content at the time was being delivered through uh, web forums. And um, so that's initially I started getting uh, stuck into that specifically related to Saudi Arabia. And I actually did a couple of years, about a year and a half with the UK foreign office. And that's when I really started looking at it um, full time really. Um, then I ended up back at the BBC a couple of years later 2006, we ended up setting up uh, a team focused on jihadist media content, mainly Arabic focused. Um, and uh, I ended up kind of running that team. We, uh, so during that time, obviously, you kind of get um, exposed to quite a lot of nasty content. Um, initially started out not too, not too bad, although there were some pretty nasty experiences quite early on. But then as you know, you get the kind of, social media plays into the impact of this stuff so back in the days of the forums it used to be not too you used to be able to kind of control and regulate what you're exposed to much more but now when things kind of moved on to twitter in 2012 uh, you ended up you know you've got these kind of feeds of information coming through you can't really control so much what you're exposed to so then it was around that time when i started taking the whole thing about the, the impact, the mental impact much more seriously. Um, even though I'd kind of had quite a lot of training in that area right from early on in my, when I first, you know, probably my first kind of training in kind of trauma awareness kind of stuff was back in 2006. Um, and so always kind of like building up, you know, you find out something interesting that kind of chimes with you and you go, okay, that makes sense. And then you kind of build up gradually as you go along. 
And it was only really when I was actually kind of running a team myself. So I ended up running uh, my team of BBC Monitoring. And then you're kind of like um, suddenly responsible for other people as well. You start taking a lot more seriously. Um, you know, you can kind of you can kind of ignore or suppress your ease, think I'm okay, I can kind of deal with it to a certain extent. But when you're kind of responsible for other people, you think, well, I really need to kind of make sure we're doing as much as we possibly can. And then thinking about all the different kind of like things you could possibly do and, you know, consulting with your team on what kind of what works because different things work for different people. One thing might work for me and something else. So, uh, Peter, Peter, yeah, carry on. Uh, just a quick question there, uh, just to be more more clear about what you're talking about. Um, the the work that you've been doing for for years and, and is essentially working with with teams and people to uh, that are looking at uh, not dangerous content but disturbing content, whether it's abuse yeah. or terrorist attacks. So tell tell us. I mean, not graphically about that, but but tell and give us an example about what what somebody might see, and then what are some things that you know you you've seen or that you do to help the the people out. Yeah. So uh, I mean, the first thing I was exposed to was like beheading video, and that was like within the a week of me starting, you know, my kind of job looking at jihadist content. You're suddenly kind of like looking at this, you know, horrific stuff which nobody really should be looking at unless, you know, it's part of their job, unless they've got a kind of serious reason for looking at it. Um, so, you know, beheadings, daily kind of pictures of kind of death and, you know, dead bodies and things like that. Um, there's quite a lot, there's quite an array of different types of kind of nasty material that you can get exposed to. When you're, you know, uh, monitoring a conflict, you're going to get this stuff all the time, especially with the kind of rise of social media. It's very difficult to kind of like regulate that exposure, as you say. So um, some of the things you can do are kind of quite simple things you can do. Like uh, Nico wrote a great blog post with um, a lot of these kind of tips in there, but a lot of which are kind of, you know, recognized myself and which I've been kind of using for years myself, like such as kind of making you know, one of the first things we learned was, okay, you kind of downloaded a video down back in the days when, you know, on the forums, you had to spend kind of 10 minutes downloading this video. Um, then when, when you'd open it, you kind of, you can then change the window size. So you can kind of make the window quite small. Um, it kind of makes the impact of watching it a lot, a lot less bad on, uh, for you. So some of the tools and tips are quite kind of low tech like that. But then there are other you know, as I kind of became aware, more aware of the um, kind of impact on you kind of mentally, there are obviously other things you can do. If you kind of start understanding what impact it, what effect it has on you, then there's, you can start kind of building in other things. So for example, like one of the things relating to kind of this material is that you're kind of quite a long way away from this stuff. So there's not much you can do about the actual suffering that you're kind of witnessing. But uh, so you can kind of leave, leave you feel quite kind of impotent or there's nothing I can do. It's quite, you know, uncomfortable feeling. But one of the first things that I learned back in my first kind of trauma awareness training was the importance of, um, uh, you know, having a strong sense of purpose. If you kind of really buy into what you're doing, you know why you're doing it, then looking at specific things can... Uh, suddenly becomes so much easier. Um, conversely, if you're kind of like stumbling across things which you don't really need to look at, look at it's suddenly a lot more confusing. So why, why am I looking at this? And, um, you know, whenever, whenever I find myself kind of responding, you know, worse myself, it's usually because actually I didn't need to look at that. So there's a lot of, there's a really important points in there about, actually not looking at more than, than you need to. There's kind of, try, there's some tips regarding- Can I ask a question? Like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, so you, you said you don't want to look at it because, um, well, I know these experience because I've been looking at a lot of jihadist content also. Mm. What are for you, if you could name a few um, singles where you weren't aware of, aware of yourself that, well, they entered your mind or your soul or your slept bed at night. When did you become aware? Was it in an early stage or was it too late? Because those things for me was, were initially pretty hard to detect. 
Yeah, right. That's interesting. Because for me, it was like pretty much right at the beginning. It was, um, it was, so it was that kind of big impact experience, like right in my first week of the job when there was this uh, hostage crisis going on. So I was at the UK Foreign Office. There was a British national out in, you know, Iraq, who along with some Americans was taken hostage. And then you get this kind of build up, you know, with the propaganda, the initial hostage video where you know they've got them. And then, you know, eventually you get the videos showing the, you know, point of death, which is, um, you know, and having to watch one of these, and I wasn't prepared for it. Um, so, and then the impact on me from that was, I kind of felt quite, you know, felt probably a bit depressed initially, quite confused as to like how I should feel about this. Um, at the same time, initially when I saw it, it was kind of like kind of fast, there's some weird fascination with what's actually going on to kind of get drawn into it. And it's that thing about probably then at that point, I was look, seeing more than I needed to see. Or what actually do I need to see for the purposes of my job? I guess I need to kind of verify that this guy's died. So, so is that also a measure for you to pre prevent, for instance, from coming numb? while looking at this information, because I noticed, for instance, when I was looking at this stuff, well, you're, you're talking about beheadings. At one moment in time, I had someone walk up my desk and I was eating my lunch, literally looking at this footage. And he was like, yeah. are you, are you, are you crazy, Nico? You're eating yeah. lunch while watching? Yeah, I'm just doing my job. And I, and yeah. that was the moment for me when I thought, well, dude, wake up. This isn't normal. You're eating lunch while looking at this horrific content. Well, yeah, I, th I can kind of see where you're coming from with that. But at the same time, you can, I mean, if you are doing this day in, day out, you need to kind of build in for yourself some kind of barriers to this content. And that may be, so you can easily kind of overload your kind of empathy with the, the people suffering. And if you're kind of empathizing too much with all the individual situations you're seeing, um, then you are going to get overloaded with that kind of distress, especially if you haven't got a channel for, 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 for kind of comprehending it. But um, so for me, if I'm kind of looking at things, I will kind of like, um, kind of zone out from it. Like, you know, you kind of got loads, all this information going through, okay, okay, I don't need to focus in too much on that. And like, so it's a kind of like a protective barrier in a way. Um, I can't say exactly how I do it. But then when you do have to kind of engage with something, then you need to, in a way, put on the kind of protective clothing, which is like, uh, you know, doing the things like making the screen smaller, maybe yeah. turning off the audio, like disconnecting the audio from the video, doing these kind of various things, which kind of can, I guess, build in some increased barrier from you. Um, yeah. there, there are some kind of interesting issues around, well, actually, are you kind of blocking out this, you know, blocking things out can be an unhealthy thing. But um, but it can, I think if you're doing it day in day out, you kind of need to have some of that in there. So, um, so if, if I was if I was to ask you uh, what would be your uh, let's say top three of uh, methods to prevent yourself from being overexposed to harmful online content, for instance, what what would be your best tips? Well, um, I guess that you know some of the things I've mentioned already, like the kind of small screen size and the audio. But but for me, the kind of key things are um, actually it's 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 something to do with around like that sense of impotence. So I am not in control of this, and there's li very little you can actually do. Um, but there are small things you can do to kind of take back that kind of agency. A set, at the end of the day, you're kind of like they're looking at this screen. You can actually walk away from it really easily. So I can just turn away from my desk and suddenly it's not, you know, it's not there anymore. So I've kind of taken back that control over what I'm being exposed to. And that's kind of really simple thing, like just getting up away from the desk and like walking away. I remember one, you know, particularly kind of, uh, it's kind of troubling in various ways video that I watched. And it was troubling not only because of the content, but it was because of the pressures I was under and all these additional external things. But then I remember kind of getting up and like walking away from that, my desk. And that's kind of the overriding memory I have of that. I don't really have many images from the video in my mind, 
but I do have this kind of sense of like a kind of like draining, like as I kind of like walked away from the desk. And actually that was like quite a positive feeling. Um, although, you know, it was quite emotional. It was like a big draining out. And, it was, and that's my kind of memory from that video, which I guess is, a, you know, I'd already been in the game for quite a long time by this point when, you know, I was much better equipped to kind of deal with these things. Um, it's really but one of the things, one of the things, I mean, you know, it's important to kind of like, so one of the key things for me is like the sense of purpose, understanding like, why you're doing something, it can really help. Like, uh, and conversely, if you if you stumble across something, it's really bad. The other thing is like talking talking about things like sen uh, social social support and like relationships and being able to kind of uh, start to kind of process the, the experiences. So not kind of bottling things up and um, and giving yourself a kind of structure, ideally, where you can do that. Uh, but if you're not, if you're not able, if you don't have a, I was, I was really lucky, kind of had a team around me, and we, one of the things I did with my team was we set up a, a monthly kind of almost self-help group. We somebody brought in some cake, and we'd sit down. And we'd like at once a month, we block out this time, so it's kind of like safe space for us, and we'd all sit down. We all end up kind of looking forward to it, and we basically talk about all the horrible stuff that we saw, and you could say that's kind of like you know. Sometimes we kind of like laugh about it, and the you know humor is quite a good way of dealing with things as well. But um, therapeutic, yeah, it can be, can yeah, be really. Yeah. Good. But um, this this whole process of kind of like talking about things, if you're kind of doing it, you know, as you're seeing things, then it can you basically start kind of processing, or you create a narrative around things, or you can understand, you know, it might be something that kind of really affected me this month, which I don't really know why and just talking it through you can go oh, actually yeah that's probably it wasn't necessarily the kind of material itself but it was those external kind of work pressures which kind of made me yeah. really stressed out while i was doing it and so having that kind of like framework where you can, can sit down with people who kind of know what you're talking about as well because they might have seen the same kind of stuff is like really powerful so, so can, can i ask a question i'm oh, oh, sorry go ahead again no against go ahead I was going to say, it, 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 there was a, a question from, from the attendants from, from NoSent, which is kind of in the same vein of what you're talking about. And he's asking, or they're asking, excuse me, um, oh, you just dropped it. There you go. All right. Uh, saying, uh, is, is it better or is there a preferred method of watching these things? Uh, is it better to watch them together with the team alone? Is there advantages or disadvantages to kind of bringing them into that space as well? So you kind of talked a little bit about, like, the offline stuff where you bring the team together and you talk about what you've seen, but is there, is there an advantage or a disadvantage to multiple people uh, viewing the same thing kind of at the same time? Um, I would generally kind of say you want to kind of reduce the exposure. So to, so if you, if, you know, if a team is like working on something, then it's probably better if only one person is looking at that thing from a point of view of, you know, reducing the exposure to, you know, or limiting it to as few people who have to kind of watch it as possible. Yeah. But at the same time, you're absolutely right in terms of, you know, the other people don't have to watch it, but the fact that you're kind of there with them kind of makes it so much better. And if you do end up like, I mean, a lot of people now are probably working at home when they, you know, they used to work in kind of office spaces and things. And um, so, you know, people are more vulnerable now because they don't have that kind of support network around them. And I certainly wouldn't, like, you may be working, you know, living with your family, but I certainly wouldn't get them to watch it with you as well. Sure. <laughs> sure. Anyway, yeah. Um, so, you know, making sure, you know, that other people around you are kind of protected from this stuff is, like, important. Um, well, and that's probably another think, well, very well, good yeah, point. Yeah. That, that you know, if you do, if you are working from home, making sure that, you know, the sounds coming from your monitor are going into headphones, yeah. that your yeah. screen, you're in a safe, protected place where yeah. your child or, or somebody else that's not expecting to see these images or yeah, these exactly. videos is going to just stumble in and then yeah. not be prepared for it. Yeah, really, really yeah. important. Because, like, you know, we, we may know why we're doing something we can kind of better equipped to deal with things where other people like, you know, they're suddenly, well, why, why on earth did I have to see that for? And that's the kind of time when, you know, you kind of end up feeling angry. Like, why on earth did I have to see that? That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Ray, did you have a question? I did. Um, so I do a lot of work with like child exploitation cases and, and you see a lot of disturbing things with that. And you mentioned um, the distance 
uh, when you're looking at stuff that it, things are so far away you can't really do anything and oftentimes these are very close. Um, have you had any situations where you couldn't do anything immediately and you had to kind of wait the long game and, and you know, it, how do you reconcile with that mentally where you can't, you know, run over and help someone right away? Yeah. Well, you know, that that's the, uh, I mean, it's a really interesting point to kind of try and get your head around. But um, it's basically this, you know, you may say, oh, I can't actually go and help that person. But maybe actually the work I'm doing is in some kind of way kind of feeding into, you know, it's a small part of trying to reduce this issue in the, in the future. If people can right. kind of understand what's happening and all this, you know, the, the, so I've kind of always had kind of quite a strong sense of purpose around, like, I know why I'm doing this. I know that it's benefiting it's kind of feeding into a better understanding so that this is less likely to kind of happen it's kind of my own small part of doing that and if you can kind of find you know if you can kind of have a strong kind of sense of values around why you're doing something and a lot of people like you know are quite passionate about things and that does go quite a long way um, but you don't necessarily have to be able to go and help that person uh, whether they're kind of close or far away it's um you know reconciling to yourself like why you're doing the job and why you know and if you don't if you don't have a kind of good reason for doing it you know maybe you should stop doing it like, well and that's that's actually one of the the things about OSINT in general I mean since you know this is an OSINT um, webcast mm. about OSINT is that sometimes we are tasked to find things to process them to analyze them and then to report and we may never have that outcome of that pedophile was apprehended or that person that yeah. that beheaded somebody uh, was taken out or whatever yeah. we may never have that closure no nope. yeah, resolution remember, yeah yeah, I used to work in an emergency room when I was younger, and and the the worst thing was is we would get somebody to come and that would come in as a patient, and we would do something, and then we would have no idea whether they went up to surgery and lived or whether um, whether they they passed away or lost the leg or whatever. So, yeah. um, not having that resolution sometimes can be very challenging. Um, next, did but you? But at least you're kind of, you know oh, why, ahead, you know you know who you're doing it for, though I guess, and so that's you know you don't necessarily need to see exactly the kind of end game in order to kind of have that strong kind of sense of I'm doing this for the right person. Kind of yeah, thing. I think that I think the reason why you're doing it, and reason for OSINT too. I mean, when you're doing an investigation and not just stumbling around in some jihadi forum looking at all the videos, when you're doing it with a purpose, you understand the larger scope. The images and the videos still may be very disturbing to watch and may still hit those trigger points. Like, I can't watch videos of kids being abused or, or hurt or any in any way. It just it's too close to some of those things that I feel strongly about. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, understanding that that person got uh, served some justice uh, would be very helpful too, but sometimes we don't get that closure. Yeah. Next. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, you mentioned at the start about how you, you sort of led a team and if you, for people who are watching this and either they work with people who do this or they lead a team of people who do this, what are some of the signs that you might see in a coworker or an employee that they're starting to get affected by this? And how do you deal with that as sort of from an intervention? Yeah. Point of view? yeah. So it's a really good question. It's not one that has like, well, it does have a quite simple answer, but there's no kind of one thing you need to look out for. Um, but the, you can kind of boil it down to basically a kind of changes in people's normal behavior. So you can't necessarily say, Oh, somebody who's with, withdrawn, you know, you, that you need to be concerned about them. They may be kind of naturally introvert and naturally kind of, you know, and maybe they're just how they are normal, normally. But if they're not, if they're kind of quite an extrovert person and then suddenly you see them being kind of quite withdrawn, um, you know, you, you should probably kind of maybe ask some questions or oh, how are you doing or something. Um, there, are, there are kind of a, a range of things you can, you can look at in general. So, I mean, if you're kind of like looking at yourself, like kind of feelings of being, you know, numbness and things or, you know, just irritability, they can be things that you might start make you kind of question, oh, actually, why am I kind of feeling like this? And I think one of the one of the really important things is just kind of like noticing, like, um, you know, looking out, noticing how your colleagues are kind of behave, you know, 
reacting to things? You know, are they kind of, um, are they kind of, you know, is their behavior slightly different from normal? But also kind of like mm-hmm. noticing about yourself, because it can be quite easy just to not put two and two together and go, oh, this, why I'm feeling a bit weird. Like, why have I been feeling like this? Maybe it's because of that. And, you know, if you're kind of talking to people about um, these things, then you can kind of just the, the kind of that processing that you're doing there um, gives that, you know, can make something kind of, um, you know, I'll give you an example, actually. So, like, for example, there, there was um, a time when I was working for the BBC when, you know, there was a kind of video that was kind of pretty graphic and nasty, and it had kids in it. And um, and I, I did feel kind of pretty rubbish about this afterwards. And I was thinking, well, actually, it wasn't the fact that the kids were there. Um, the, the reason why I found it so difficult is because it was a time when Islamic State group was really trying to kind of push all these buttons. And because I was working for the media, it kind of slightly undermined my sense of purpose myself um, because I kind of felt complicit in the propaganda, you know. Kind of like they, they got you. Yeah, they're they got like, they're you getting too. me and they know that they're doing this. Like they put these kids like in a castle, like in some kind of like historic site. Oh, I, re- I camera- remember that one. You remember yeah. that one? Yeah, they had I do. All- yeah, they had all these camera angles and the kids, like, they sent the kids into the castle. It was like the Hunger Games, basically. They sent the kids into the castle and the kids, like, you know, had guns. And then there were these, like, um, I probably shouldn't go into too much detail, but there were these, like, no. prisoners in there. And they ended up, the kids killed these prisoners um, in some pretty group. Yeah. <laughs> so so sh- shifting from from uh, the horrific content, um, yeah. thank you, 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 you you told us that you started looking at forums back in the early 2000s, right? So yeah. um, you've been primarily focused on jihadist groups online over the decades. Uh, what have you done within the, let's say, the open source intelligence field, to, uh, technique or tool-wise, or, or to uh, to keep researching these groups? Because I know for a fact they, well, they also grew and throughout the years. Around. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about, um, well, especially because this is still the Ocean Couriers pod, uh, podcast, yeah, webcast. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you tell, tell us a little bit how you, uh, well, uh, were able to keep track of, to keep yeah, track yeah. of him? <clears throat> I think basically uh, right from the early days, um, what you do is you kind of immerse yourself in a way in the community and you basically watch the community evolve as, you know, even back in the early days, the forums were getting taken down. Um, if you had a if you kind of got your network that you're watching, one part of the network goes down. Everyone then starts talking about, oh, where do we go next? And there were some like major times back in, I can't remember in the yeah late 2000s when a lot of these big forums were getting taken down. Always tended to kind of coincide with 9/11 because uh, I think the US was trying to like uh, deprive them of propaganda space. And um, and then you'd see them because there were they had several other kind of forums. They'd kind of move move on to another one. You'd watch the kind of migration onto there. And then you know more recently with kind of the Telegram. Uh, well, so after the forums, they kind of then moved on to Twitter, and you could see people talking about that, and you'd follow them. And then they ended up all there. And then a couple of years later, they move on to Telegram. And then at the end of last year, Telegram started uh, taking uh, had a big kind of campaign, which was now then sustained kind of to try and kick them off. They're not completely off there. But then you see people talking about all kinds of, you know, quite obscure platforms, uh, things that, you know, I'd never heard of one called BCM, which was, uh, doesn't exist anymore. It didn't last very long. Um, Hoop Messenger started using, um, there's a open source platform called Rocket Chat, which is a kind of bit like slack but you can kind of download it onto your own server so you know they jihadists are always looking for new technology in order to uh and so decentralized web platforms have kind of been quite a big thing recently uh where they're trying to kind of basically retain control of the data themselves and avoid um you know uh handing it all over to kind of a big centralized platform like uh you know telegram facebook etc who can then take them all down so Right, yeah, so that it's interest. harder for them to. Yeah. It's harder for them to be, get kicked off a platform if they own the platform. Yeah. yeah. 
But still, I, I, I don't know if you agree with me. I, there is a change because all those larger, well-known platforms, they have been taking good countermeasures, not always, but the impact of uh, the propaganda is way less than it was like five years ago because yeah. they were everywhere then. You, yeah, could, you exactly. could not not see it. Yes, you're right. Um, and, you know, the big platforms like Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube are really doing loads, loads, making massive efforts uh, to kind of take stuff down. They're doing a lot of automated efforts to take things down. Um, but still, stuff still gets through and, you know, it's still fairly easy. But the, I think the important thing is it's less easily accessible just for, to ordinary people. You're much less likely just to stumble across something. Uh, because they, they used to kind of hijack hashtags and things. So, you know, if you're following a hashtag, you just suddenly, you know, about like, you know, the the Super Bowl or something. And so yeah, the hashtag yeah, hijacking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hashtag yeah. hijacking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Peter, I would really like to thank you for now for this interview because, well, we're well over time already and we need Sorry, to discuss yeah, some, some news. No, no, no problem because yeah. it was really interesting because I, I really, yeah, this is awesome. I, I can talk for hours about especially this, the, the traumatic uh, part of, yeah. of doing online investigations in general and people just underestimate it. That's, yeah. yeah. And I really, really would like to thank you for your insights and, and well, you clearly hear years of knowledge and learn and a very, very steep learning curve with that where, where you, well, learn to cope with it, learn to uh, help your team with it, and now helping the Ocean Curious listeners. Yeah. Were and I'm still aware. here. I've been yeah. still here, so I must be yeah. doing something right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you're still smiling, too. That's, yeah. that's a real big sign. So uh, one of the things that we usually ask our guests when, they, uh, when we're, we're finished is, what is something that you want to learn um, usually OSINT related, but in yeah. this case, it can it yeah. encompass the larger field of uh, uh, terrorists. It can be in mental health. Uh, what yeah. are you looking to get better at in this coming year? Well, um, one thing I'm kind of curious to learn about and be is um, there's kind of various studies done about like Tetris having kind of an inoculative effect. Like if you what if you play Tetris after like watching a really nasty video, um, it uh, kind of disrupts the laying down of the memories process so it kind of the the evidence is that it um people who watch tetris um or play tetris sorry half an hour after watching a, a video you know depicting kind of death and violence and things have far fewer kind of uh, substantially kind of fewer um uh flashbacks than if you if you don't play it now um i'm interested in finding out if uh, there are other kind of um games which might uh, have a similar effect. It seems to be something to do with the, the way you're kind of like mentally kind of rotating things. It's a visual spatial, visual spatial kind of element to this game, which kind of interrupts and uh, prevents these kind of memories getting stored in a kind of uh, unhealthy way. I'm just interested to know if, uh, to find out if there are other similar games or tasks which have a similar effect that may not be as kind of potentially stressful as Tetris like to play. <laughs> yes. Because like if you play Tetris, you can get really quite stressed out by it. And that may kind of not, not be quite so good. So I'm sure there are kind of other games out there which kind of have a similar kind of effect on the brain, which you could play, which, you know, uh, I find Tetris a bit annoying. So uh, yeah, anyway, that, that's yeah. Yeah, kind of... <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Peter, for being on here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Peter is uh, on Twitter at IbexMind, so twitter.com slash IbexMind. And also, Peter's on the website, IbexMind.com, um, where you'll find a whole bunch of information about his... Uh, Peter, is this a, a, a non-profit? Is this a, a company? I'm sorry. Yeah, we're a company. We, uh, yeah, we will... So we deliver kind of tra training, so initial training. Um, but the kind of key thing we offer is, is uh, after a couple of like um, introductory foundation workshops on, you know, introduction to kind of resilience and things like that. And we facilitate these uh, monthly kind of support sessions, the kind that I used to kind of run with my team. Um, yeah. So we come in and we can, I work with a, my partner who's a kind of neuropsychologist, um, uh, with the NHS, which is the uh, you know state health service in the UK, and um, he's got a kind of 
long experience. He's got more of the evidence base than I have. So I've kind of got the experience of um, l looking at all the nasty stuff. But it's kind of bring those two things together with the evidence base plus actually, you know, I, I've kind of been there and done this. And um, we kind of found in my team in the past that actually trying to get kind of psychological experts on board, people would often, you know, find it difficult to kind of engage with them or you'd find it a bit of a taboo. And so we're trying to depathologize the whole thing, make it much more accessible to ordinary people. So, um, you know, you're not feeling like I'm a patient, I'm being given therapy or anything. Basically trying to build on people's initial strengths and kind of build on um, you know, the, the inherent strengths in a team um, to allow people to kind of learn from each other and get better at, um, you know, helping each other out when, when we're not there. Cool. Well, thank you, Peter. Appreciate that. Um, and now um, with, uh, well, let, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some things that have happened in the last couple of weeks. And I would like to start off with thanking two new Patreon members, Adam Maxwell and Sarah Wilmer, uh, for supporting our project and, and uh, financially through our Patreon. Let's get into some of the links. Now, Nix, I think you were the one that mentioned Spoonville. Is that right? Yeah, uh, so this is a new tool I came across this week, uh, which I really like, actually. It's very useful. Um, it's basically, it's sort of a living Twitter archive, but it tracks changes in people's Twitter bios and in their pinned tweets and their usernames. So the idea is you, you sign up for it. You, it's a third-party app. You allow it access to your Twitter account. And then anyone you're following, every time they update their bio or they change their location or they change their screen name, um, you can you get notified when that happens. Um, but I discovered actually, you, even if you don't sign up for it and you don't connect, you you can actually query a lot of Twitter accounts that are archived in there. So my own is in there. I, I've obviously checked out, and you can see all the bio changes that made since the account started, all the different pin tweets I've had, or like or when locations have changed, things like that. Um, it's quite useful because the Internet Archive and Google Cache often don't pick up on a lot of those changes, but this tool seems to be able to do that for Twitter. It's quite good. Um, they do say, I don't, haven't tried it with GitHub, but they do say it works with GitHub accounts as well. Yeah, there were a couple more up here, like GitHub and Product Hunt. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard of Product Hunt. And I haven't tried it for GitHub, but yeah, apparently it works for all Spoonbill of always reminds me of Bio has changed. It was a tool that used to work really well, and then we were out of a tool for a while, and then Spoonbill came up. Yeah, really useful for tracking accounts, especially when you're looking for those uh, specific, I, or at least I like to use it for those specific troll accounts and to keep track of them because they change their username every five yeah. seconds. Yep. Cool. Thanks. And next, while we got you on the line, why don't you tell us about this wonderful free uh, aircraft monitoring site yeah, that you this, found? This was the OSINT tool I didn't know I needed, but now I, since I discovered <laughs> it, I like on it all the time. Um, so this is Freedar, and that, that's at radar.freedar.uk. And um, it's a flight tracking website, um, like Flight Radar 24, like ADSB Exchange. But the real big difference on this one is it doesn't filter out all the military flights and drones and things like that. Um, I guess now it's a Sunday, so I guess all the military are all having a day off. So um, well, let's but, see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, look. Oh, uh, wait. I see an alien aircraft up on the left or right. There was really an alien aircraft logo. Yeah, the, the, I have seen that flying around, but it's good because, I mean, obviously we're familiar with like flight trackers like Flight Radar 24, but this doesn't filter out all the military aircraft because they, I guess they still have to broadcast their position uh, and you can pick it up. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff on there, like you're watching training exercises, you could like NATO aircraft flying in Eastern Europe, obviously on, on deployments. And um, I'm not aware of any other trackers that offer that. Um, so maybe. this this has the exact same interface as uh, ADSB Exchange used to have before they just changed it. In fact, the filtering and all that looks exactly exactly like it. But ADSB Exchange has now changed to this enhanced interface, which where they I don't know if they filter out things, but they don't give you access to things that like like this anymore. So this is this is really cool. Yeah, I spent way too long there this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Thanks, man. 
Yeah, so that's uh, radar.freedar.uk. And one of the things that I did um, while Nix was talking is change the receiver. By default, the receiver is just for UK. And when Nix tweeted this out, I'm like, dude, it's only for the UK and surrounding area. He's like, no, go to the menu, choose world feed, and then you can go to other places. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, um, Ray, Wondersmith Ray, and I uh, and many other people spoke at the Larry conference a couple weeks ago, and our talks were recorded. They are available on the YouTube channel for Layer 8, and also ones from last year's Layer 8 conference are also on there. So uh, go check that out if you weren't able to make the conference. Again, uh, wonderful free OSINT videos on all of the cool things, including Ray Baker's OSINT on the Ocean, Maritime Intelligence. What did you there think about There were some really good the, presentations. Yeah, yeah. What did you think about the experience of presenting uh, virtually? Was it good? I thought they did a really good job. It, it went over without any issues. Um, I liked, I'm not a fan of Discord really, but um, it worked out well. Um, I think overall they did a really good job. I agree. I agree. Yeah, and there were some really interesting talks because I couldn't attend, yeah. but now I like that the videos are up and I can look them at my own pace because I'm <laughs> old, I need my own pace. Yeah, and did Nico, <laughs> I'm old, I need my own pace. <laughs> you got your own pace, man. Um, so uh, while we're talking about videos, the, uh, Sector 035 released a 10-minute uh, tip on Google Dorking, which is one uh, that is a companion video for his uh, blog post that he re released earlier this year. And this can be found on our 10-minute tip YouTube playlist, which you can visit from our YouTube channel. Let's get to a couple of other uh, tools that are out there and techniques. This is actually kind of a tool and technique. and um, I don't know who, which of you want to talk about this, but this is OSINT Combine, one of our sponsors, and just a, Chris Poulter is an amazing, amazingly technical dude that can explain things well, I, and I love that about him. He wrote a blog post here on his OSINT Combine site about how to use things within your browser, the web developer tools, to visit different social media applications and download those videos. Specifically, he was looking for videos in this short blog post. But how do we use the web developer tools to identify where those videos are coming from on the site and then go ahead and download them without those wonderful extensions that all of us know and love? And it's a very easy to access blog post. It's, it's easy to understand. He gives these great little um, uh, uh, images and shows you how to do it as well. Now, OSINT Curious, we also have a 10 minute tip or two about using the web developer tools. So if you need a little tutorial, we got you. Yeah, great blog post. Yeah. Um, now, this one also popped up. Nix, I believe you uh, were the one that, that submitted this for us to talk about. You want to explain what it is? Yeah, um, this is a guide to investigating website infrastructure, uh, and it's been put together by Amnesty International. Um, part, they had their, this citizen, citizen evidence website where they teach people investigative techniques. Um, it's really, really good because it's pitched at sort of people who are beginners to understanding the internet and investigating websites. So if you if things like DNS and IP addresses and who is are a little confusing to you, um, it's a really good place to start. But um, it goes through looking at how um, IP addresses and domains are linked, how we can look at passive DNS to see where websites and IP addresses might have been linked together in the past, even if they're not now. Um, how you can use who is because everyone thinks well who is since GDPR is a waste of time uh, There's still little nuggets of information there that are useful And then he ties it all together with a practical example at the end looking at how different malware and phishing sites will link together uh, But it's a really good comprehensive introduction to that topic Nice and a lot of OSINTers focus more like like Peter and Nico were talking about more on catching terrorists or or, or finding people that well finding people and uh, some of them are also focusing on IPs and domains so for those of you that are primarily people focused understanding how to look at IPs and domains and and harvest that data and what data sources are out there aside from those social media platforms is really really useful. Now, Nix, you also submitted this quite in this uh, article, which many of us saw about the FBI over in the United States using uh, essentially a, a picture that was taken from some protests in Philadelphia of a person uh, uh, throwing a Molotov cocktail at a police car, and they found the person. You want to 
walk through it a little bit? Yeah, this is um, quite complicated how they did it, but really is an example of what's possible through OSINT. It's really complicated because uh, it's a really complicated bit of OSINT work, but it's nearly all OSINT. There's no like advanced spatial recognition tools or phone taps to do this one. Um, basically, as you see in the picture, this lady was uh, throwing a Molotov cocktail, I think, at this police car, uh, and the FBI tried to find out who did it. And so they went to Instagram and found, I think it was in Philadelphia somewhere, um, yeah. found about 500 different photos of this demonstration. And they discovered this woman, you can see on the right there, uh, was wearing this blue T-shirt with, um, I think, a Black Lives Matter slogan on. And um, so they started to focus on the T-shirt and they find the only place you can buy that T-shirt is on Etsy, which is a store where independent uh, retailers sell their stuff. Uh, they found she had left a review of the T-shirt, I think, on the Etsy page or thanked them for the shipping. So they got her username from Etsy. And then they did, like we've all done many times, researched her username. And they found her profile on Poshmark, which is another clothing fashion site, which I was not aware of. Um, oh, and then from her Poshmark profile, they moved on to her. That was linked to her LinkedIn profile. Then from the LinkedIn, they found out where she worked, what she did for a living, what her real name was. Uh, and then they found photos of her on LinkedIn, I think, because she works as a masseuse. Uh, they had uh, photos of this very distinctive tattoo, which matched to the tattoo of her on LinkedIn, matched to the tattoo of her when she's throwing the petrol bomb. Uh, only at that point, I think, did the FBI then try and verify it. That's when they started doing subpoenas to these companies. But the actual link between the throwing the petrol bomb and identifying the girls, all done through OSINT, just pivoting through social media platforms, yeah. Mostly. Classical OSINT. I really, I really enjoyed reading the steps in the story just because, well, like you said, you pivot up from point one to point two to point three to yeah. getting someone. Yeah, really cool to see. Yeah, it's just that, that curiosity, keep pushing and see how far you can get. Yeah, powerful stuff. All right, um, moving on to some Trace Lab uh, things. Uh, Trace Lab has in the last week or two, probably two weeks, uh, uh, announced that they're changing the name for their OSINT v uh, CTF, the uh, missing CTF, where they allow people around the world to look for missing people and uh, submit tips in a capture the flag format. They're changing that name to the OSINT search party capture the flag, a search party like we're going out and trying to look for somebody. And uh, they've changed that. And also they announced their global OSINT, um, OSINT search party capture the flag coming up. And it's coming up Saturday, July 11th, uh, UTC time there. And there is training. I'm not sure if, if they've already exhausted all this, but OSINT Combine has, has partnered with them to give some free OSINT training to help people understand how to do OSINT better and find some better uh, tips out there. So I think they uh, are out of the uh, OSINT Combine training. Um, yeah. I do want to add that these are going to be monthly global uh, events now. Yep. Yeah, these are going to be monthly uh, global events. Uh, thank you, Ray. And um, if you are a person that is unsure about, well, what tools do I need on my system to do that and to actually participate, go to their website. They have a whole bunch of resources. And in fact, they just released the Trace Labs OSINT VM, which is kind of an alpha product right now. It's, yeah. it, they're, they put it out there for comment and for other people to use. It's made by the people that make the Kali cybersecurity uh, VM that's out there in the world. Uh, so you can download this for free. The username and password are Kali Kali, and um, you can try it out. Here's a bunch of the things that are on there. And the, the benefit of using a VM is that anything that you do is uh, semi-isolated from your host system, and you, yeah. you don't have to worry about installing things on your host uh, computer. Be aware, though, because I read some people are reviewing the VM saying that some tools were still a little bit clunky because, well, you said it's in alpha stage, right? So, Yeah, and they are, and that's a great point, Nico. They are very much looking for your feedback, and I think they, they tell you back here that they are really open to feedback, and they want to know what you think. Yeah, we're open to any and all feedback. Their goal is to create this VM, and then I think it's to turn it over to the OSINT community for us to say, hey, this tool needs to be on there. That extension needs to be on there and, and run with it. But I'm not quite sure about that. So give it a try um, if you want. 
Yep. We also just created a contestant guide that has a lot of information on how to compete and uh, resource links and uh, mental health uh, suggestions um, because a lot of times you have to leave these cases and never look back, which is very applicable to our conversation today. Yeah. So that's pretty cool and um, check that out. Cool. Lots of free resources over there at Trace Labs. And Nico, you are going to be doing a SANS webcast uh, yes, this coming week, right? Yeah, Tuesday. on Tuesday. Yeah, it will be at uh, 1700 hours UTC time, so universal time zone. And I will be talking about, well, the basics of uh, video and image verification using, um, well, basically two tools in the Chrome browser. I will teach you in approximately one and a half, two hours what you can do with it. What, well, you guys know me by now, the thought process, that's what counts. Yeah, and, and uh, that's free. And it, it's yeah. a hands-on workshop where yeah. it's not just you lecturing for an hour and a half. It's no. us doing stuff, it, right? It will be a, a, let's say, 30, 45 minutes lecture, and then it will be hands-off. And uh, it won't be recorded, so you need to attend live. And there's a max capacity also. And I'm hearing rumors that it's getting pretty packed. So be there or be square. Be uh, there. I've already registered. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Very cool. Oh, no pressure there at all now. Yep, yeah, yep. now you actually have to do something really amazing. Well, everybody, that brings us to the end of our webcast podcast. Um, I would once again love to thank Peter for, for being on here and sharing his information about how to work with challenging, disturbing mental health concepts when you're doing your OSINT. Peter, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thank you to our wonderful attendees and our panelists here for making this another webcast that is uh, going to be posted very shortly to our website and all. Um, Nico, why don't you tell us uh, anything that you want to share with us about your shameless self-promotion? Where are you going to be this uh, upcoming week or two? Uh, just check out my website, that's com. There will be a few things coming up where you can also sign up for. Okay. All right, Nix. Yeah, I, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm at Nix Intel, and most new stuff I come across or blogs I write end up there sooner or later. Cool. Ray? Um, not too much new. I just put out a blog on using uh, nature to yeah. track location. I did not include it in this story. <laughs> yeah, I was, but, right. I was wondering why you didn't, I, but all right. I know, but you can find it on uh, Twitter. Um, wonder school, wonder like Smith, a little underscore Ray. Can you give us a synopsis? What do you mean using nature? Yeah, like using, um, you know, uh, like trees and plants to determine location, maybe like a plant that grows near water. You can determine that you're looking at a photo that is near water. Um, just nice. stuff like that. You'll have to look. All right. And that's on your Medium site? Is that right? Yes, it is. And you can find it through my Twitter. Okay. Cool, Ray. Thanks. Ginsburg. Uh, not a ton from me coming right now. Still finish up projects at work and stuff. Been very, very busy. Um, but, uh, you know, stick around and we'll be doing some of the stuff later this year. So it'd be good. <laughs> okay. Peter, is there any place that you'd like to uh, tell people about for this coming couple weeks or month? Well, uh, no, just uh, give us a follow on, twi uh, on Twitter and, uh, you know, check out. We kind of post some things or repost some articles and, um, you know, tips and things like that, which you might find useful. Or get in touch with us if you want to, uh, you know, get us uh, to help you out. Excellent. Cool. Thanks. Um, and for me, um, SANS Sec 487 OSINT class is still going. We're doing live online. Nico's teaching one right now. Well, not right now, but like, you know, during the week normally. Um, Nico's teaching them. I'm teaching them. In fact, Nico's going to be doing a live in-person class, not just an online one, in yeah. August in Amsterdam, right? Yeah, wow. please, jo please join me all because we get to hang out in person again. Yes, I'm so excited for that. Six feet apart, wearing yeah, six, masks. Yeah, but still. Covered in hands. But still. But still. Yeah. 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 Wow, man. It must um, be nice being outside of America. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Been really, uh, really enjoyed the topics today. And I guess there's only one le one thing left to say, everybody, right? It's yeah. stay, stay oh, sing, and period. period. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. Oh, take care. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>
Bye, everybody.